one of the striking things about anti-Semitism is that it seems, very sadly, to be a human perennial. And I say that because all the evidence points that way. It's also a shapeshifter. It's probably the greatest shapeshifter in, uh, in history. There are people who used to hate the Jews because of their religion. And then at some point it became less acceptable to hate people because of their religion. And then the Jews were hated because of their race. And then at some point in the 20th century it became not so good to hate people because of their race. But there was one twist left, which was that the Jews who were hated by anti-Semites because they were stateless were suddenly hated because they had a state. It's um, one of the insights of a number of writers that the Jews get hated for absolutely every reason. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable fact. The Jews have been hated historically and by people in the world today and even on people on X to today for all of the following reasons. They have been hated because they've been poor and they've been hated because they've been rich. They've been hated because they have not integrated into society and they get hated for integrating into the society. They get hated or as I say, being rootless cosmopolitans, and then for being Zionists who dare to have a state and not be rootless. Douglas Murray's unyielding crusade continues as he fearlessly traverses nations, championing unwavering truths. In his latest endeavor, he tackles the alarming surge of anti-Semitism, notably escalating post-October 7th. With unwavering determination, Murray's insights illuminate this pressing issue unafraid to address the stark realities. His steadfast commitment to facing uncomfortable truths serves as a guiding light of integrity in a world overshadowed by darkness. Well, thank you very much for that very warm introduction. It's a, a huge pleasure to me uh, to be back here in the Netherlands, a country where I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in the past. And I have a lot of friends, which I think very fondly of. Um, I sometimes remember that some years ago, a Dutch friend of mine visited me in London and uh, said to me, uh, I won't do the accent, but said, uh, uh, what are people saying in London about the Netherlands these days? And I was slightly caught and I said, they're not all talking about you, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, but I think that's their problem, not yours. Uh, there's a good reason to focus on this country. I think it's a fascinating and important country uh, with a rich, rich history and a, and a rich, potentially very rich future as well. Uh, like all of us, it depends on you getting things right. Um, but I wanted to talk tonight about the subject of anti-Semitism. Um, and let me start with relatively recent events. Um, after the nature of the October the 7th attacks became clear, I said uh, that there are some times in your life when a flare goes up and you can see everybody exactly where they are. Everyone is caught exactly where they're standing. I thought that in part because I was in New York on the 7th and the next day, the 8th, there was a protest immediately planned in Times Square. It wasn't a protest in support of the Israelis who had already been massacred. It wasn't even a protest uh, against I know, war. It was a protest in favor of the ongoing massacres, where people were waving banners, celebrating atrocities which were still going on. And I thought then, well, I have to go to Israel as soon as I can in order to see this for myself, because it was my belief then, as it is now, that not only was this a moment when you would see everyone where they were, but that several things would happen. One was what I described as Holocaust denial in real time, 
where even as the atrocities were still going on, people were saying they hadn't happened, or that the Israelis had carried them out. There was a huge debate in the early weeks about whether or not the Israelis should release the footage that Hamas filmed themselves. And by the way, you've got to have a particularly perverted mind to believe that the Israelis made Hamas take the GoPro footage of the thing. Douglas Murray's staunch stance on anti-Semitism deserves unyielding support. His observations of the October 7th attacks, especially the displays of support for ongoing massacres, reveal the stark reality of modern anti-Semitism. Murray rightly points out the disturbing trend of Holocaust denial happening in real time, a despicable act that demands immediate condemnation. Should we tolerate such blatant atrocities and deceit, or adamantly stand against them? The striking thing about all of the footage from the 7th from the Hamas terrorists is that they were wildly proud of their achievements. Wildly proud. And also wildly gleeful which is a sort of new level of evil in a way. Many people have done many evil things in history, but very few are actively proud of them in this way. Some of you may have heard the intercepted conversation of one of the terrorists calling his mother in Gaza and saying, I'm calling you on a Jew's phone. I've killed 10 Jews with my own hands. Pass father onto the phone. Pass, pass all the family on. I want to tell them all your son is killed all these people with his own hands. When I arrived in Israel and started to speak not just to the survivors, spend time with the families of the hostages, but also go around the sites of all the massacres in the communities in the south, villages, kibbutz of Beri and near Oz and the site of the festival, the dance festival where all these hundreds of beautiful young people were just dancing in the early morning when true evil arrived in their midst. When I went around this, I always had a disconnect because as I heard all these stories firsthand and was shown the footage of people's own footage of the day, party goers who had recorded a little bit of their escape or their friend's death. All the time I looked back home to New York, to London, to Europe, and everywhere, the sympathy had gone the other way. And I thought that was extraordinary. I sort of expected it all my life, whenever Israel has done anything, uh, world response goes up and up and up, whatever the size of the Israeli action. Uh, I first heard the accusation the Israelis were committing genocide in Gaza in 2008, so I'm a little jaded with that accusation. It would also, of course, make it the only genocide in history in which the population doubled, but let's put that aside for a second. It struck me that all these people back home didn't for a day call for the release of the Israeli hostages. Not one day. I'd have some sympathy and understanding and indeed respect for people who said, you know, I campaigned for the release of the hostages, I paid my respects to the dead and the murdered of the seventh, and I deeply sympathized with their families, but I also sympathized with the innocent Palestinians. I'd have some respect for that position. But it's very hard to have any respect for somebody's allegedly anti-war position when they're mute at the largest murder of Jews since the Holocaust. Douglas Murray's unwavering truth exposes the chilling pride and joy exhibited by Hamas terrorists in their gruesome acts. Their sickening boastfulness sets a new depth of depravity rarely seen in history. Murray's first-hand experiences in Israel reveal a stark contrast. While facing unspeakable horrors, sympathy for the victims waned abroad. Can we ignore such heinous pride and indifference towards innocent lives? A friend of mine came through Tel Aviv in January and he said, you know, Douglas, this is the first place I've been since October where none of the hostage posters have been torn down. I thought, think about that for a moment, that in London, 
You can't put up a hostage poster. Even if a now 18-month-year-old child without it being torn down. One of the relatives of the Bebas child, who's the youngest hostage, who passed his first birthday in captivity. Um, one of his relatives told me he went to Dublin to try to appeal to the Irish Taoiseach for his help, some help. And um, he actually saw there the poster of his baby relative been ripped. I said, just think about that for a second. If if here in Rotterdam somebody put up a poster to their missing dog, would anyone pull it down? Would anyone rip it down? If they did rip it down, would we not all say, who is this sick person going around ripping down posters of a missing dog? Everyone wants the dog home. And yet, that is not extended to the Jewish children, the women, or indeed the men. One of the things that's striking in Israel since the seventh is the fact that so many people have focused on the, the women and children and the importance of releasing them, and that is important. But there is also no crime in being a young man of 21 at a dance party. And there's no crime in being a 70-year-old grandfather who hoped to spend Simchat Torah with his grandchildren. But all the time, the sympathy went the other way. The, the protests on the campuses not only fell straight into the Palestinian side, but fell straight into the Hamas side. At Columbia University, there's been an encampment now for some months um, in the main square. And overlooking that square, by the way, are 18 great figures of the Western past, including Aristotle, Plato, and Dante. I do sometimes wonder what they would think of the current state of American thought if they could see the students who, one of whom complained recently that there weren't adequate toilet facilities at the encampment, complained that she had to do her business in a bag and then throw it in a larger bag of shit. $65,000 a year. $65,000 a year that girl's parents pay for her education. But. It's at Columbia University in New York where Jewish students have been pursued across campus by people shouting, go back to Poland. Or on one occasion, had a poster held up in front of them saying, Hamas, these are your next targets. It's uh, in London that we've had protests every single weekend. It's here in the Netherlands where you saw an eight-fold increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the month after October the 7th. Douglas Murray is completely right. Londoners tear down children's hostage posters, but would we allow posters of missing dogs to be torn in Rotterdam? The focus on victims in Israel is vital, including young men and elderly grandfathers. Yet sympathy often teeters towards the wrong side. The rise in anti-Semitic incidents is alarming. How can we ignore such blatant injustice? And it does bear dwelling on for a second that. I wonder, I wonder if it was any other group in society who had suffered such a barbaric outburst if the public would so strongly turn on the victims. It's hard to imagine. There was a maniac in America a few years ago, a white supremacist who went into a church in the south, a black church, and gunned down these innocent Christian worshippers. And you know, nobody in the United States of America or anywhere around the world said, well, you know, it's possible he was provoked into it. No, everyone's sympathy is with these poor families who had to go through this horrific incident. And it's the same with any other group in society, except with the Jews. It's even, I think, to the shame of this country, when a Holocaust museum is opened in Amsterdam and a Holocaust survivor is photographed rushing past an angry mob screaming at him and his grandson. Douglas Murray's words hit hard with undeniable truth. He rightly exposed society's double standards when it comes to the Jewish community. Imagine if any other group faced the barbarity the Jews have endured. 
Would people still shift blame to the victims? Remember the chilling attack on a black church by a white supremacist? The world united in condemnation. Why the exception when it's about the Jews? And one of the ways I submit that you can tell that somebody hasn't thought about anti-Semitism at all is if they say something like the following. Anti-Semitism must be eradicated once and for all. The former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, occasionally used to say this. He is an anti-Semite. But um, he used to occasionally say, that's why anti-Semitism, racism, and all other forms of hate must be eradicated once and for all. And I used to say, that shows you've never thought about the matter. I'd submit that uh, one of the striking things about anti-Semitism is that it seems, very sadly, to be a human perennial. And I say that because... All the evidence points that way. It's also a shapeshifter. It's probably the greatest shapeshifter in, uh, in history. There are people who used to hate the Jews because of their religion. And then at some point it became less acceptable to hate people because of their religion. And then the Jews were hated because of their race. And then at some point in the 20th century, it became not so good to hate people because of their race. But there was one twist left, which was that the Jews who were hated by anti-Semites because they were stateless were suddenly hated because they had a state. It's um, one of the insights of a number of writers that the Jews get hated for absolutely every reason. It's... it's, it's an unbelievable fact. The Jews have been hated historically and by people in the world today, and even on people on X to today, for all of the following reasons. They have been hated because they've been poor, and they've been hated because they've been rich. They've been hated because they have not integrated into society, and they get hated for integrating into the society. They get hated for, as I say, being rootless cosmopolitans and then for being Zionists who dare to have a state and not be rootless. Vasily Grossman. Douglas Murray is absolutely right in his stark assessment of anti-Semitism. The hatred towards Jews has taken many forms throughout history, morphing to fit societal norms. From religious persecution to racial prejudice, the Jews have faced enmity for merely existing. Anti-Semitism, a relentless shapeshifter, proves its deep-rooted nature. How can one simply say, eradicate once and for all, without understanding its complexities and historic persistence? My, one of my heroes, the great Russian uh, 20th century uh, writer and journalist, uh, took time out in the middle of his masterpiece, Life and Fate, to write about this question. And to my mind, Vasily Grossman said almost everything that can be said about anti-Semitism. Grossman, who was Jewish himself, covered the Battle of Stalingrad. He was the first journalist into Treblinka. And he knew an awful lot about human evil. And in the middle of life and fate, which gravitates around that midnight of the 20th century, halfway through this 900-page novel, halfway through the midnight of the midnight, Grossman takes three pages to write about anti-Semitism. And he says something which can't be said often enough, and I wish more people knew. He, he talks about the way, he says, in which it's something you can meet everywhere. He says, you can meet it in the Academy of Sciences and in the games that children play in the schoolyard. He says, it takes many forms from a mocking, contemptuous ill will to murderous pogroms. Then he says this, anti-Semitism is always a means rather than an end. It is a measure of the contradictions yet to be resolved. It is a mirror for the failings of individuals, social structures, and state systems. Tell me what you accuse the Jews of, and I'll tell you what you're guilty of. I, um, I spoke to a psychiatrist some years ago in a 
professional capacity, I should stress, uh, um, who, who claimed to me that he could tell with very considerable certainty when one of his patients was going to turn anti-Semitic. And I said, what are the giveaways? He said, one of the giveaways is it arrives just after intense paranoia. It seemed to me to make amazing sense that. Because why else do people fall into it? Why do they fall into it even if they meant not to? Douglas Murray rightfully champions the wise words of Vasily Grossman, a heroic figure who bravely tackled anti-Semitism in his works. Grossman, a Jew who witnessed the horrors of human evil in wartime, dissected anti-Semitism brilliantly. He highlighted how this hatred seeps into every aspect of society, from academia to children's games, manifesting in various insidious forms. It's not just an ideology. It's a reflection of deeper unresolved issues within individuals and societies. The story that Paul Berman writes about in his book called Power and the Idealists, which has the rather off-putting subtitle, Or the Strange Passion of Joska Fischer. Not everyone wants to know about the passions of Joska Fischer, but it's a magnificent work of intellectual history. And it gravitates around the history of the green left movement in Germany after the war. And as Berman says, the Germans growing up after the horrors of the Nazis, had, they were sensible, they had one, one rule above all, don't be Nazis. Don't be like our parents. And if you're going to have any guiding principle, that's not a bad one. But Berman shows how this generation some of whom were flatmates of the future German foreign minister, in the 1950s were still holding to this light. Don't be Nazis. Don't do what our parents did. By the 1960s, many of them have gravitated to the cause of the PLO and the nascent Palestinian movement. By the time that the Palestinians are hijacking airline planes, one of Joska Fischer's former flatmates is on the plane with the terrorists and divides up the Jews from the non-Jews. We've done it again. I'd submit that many of the people in our own time are actually repeating that very mistake. I think that the people who have been most vocal in the last seven months or so fall into two categories. They are what I describe as the sinister and the silly. The sinister are the ones who know exactly what they mean. When they say from the river to the sea, they know that they mean the eradication of the only Jewish state. They have a plan. They seem to approve of violence. They seem very often to be very sympathetic with Hamas, whilst knowing full well what Hamas does. And then there's the silly. And those are the ones who are very impressionable and along for the ride. I'm thinking of the sort of people who shout from the river to the sea endlessly, as if you shout something often enough, we'll agree. And uh, couldn't identify which river they're talking about and have no idea what the sea is. There was a woman in New York who was captured on camera shouting, from the mountain to the sea. <laughs> which mountain? I don't know. The Alps, something. Douglas is absolutely correct. The sinister and the silly are leading us astray, echoing a dangerous path as in the past. They advocate for violence and the destruction of the only Jewish state. Consider Josef Fischer's former flatmate encountering the chilling reality of dividing passengers based on ethnicity. Can we afford to ignore history and repeat such horrendous mistakes? Look at the, the way in which the world has reacted in recent weeks. In the last few days, trending on X, we have all eyes on Rafa. All eyes on Rafa. Why would you have all your eyes on Rafa? Oh, always, of course, said as if the person in question has often thought about Rafa in the past and is an expert on the whole arrangements in the neighborhood. Of course, many of these people are the people who are experts on everything and have been expert on absolutely everything in recent years. They tended to be experts on pandemics first, 
then they are experts on vaccine policy, then they are experts on how to withdraw from Afghanistan, they were experts on Ukraine, and now they're experts on RAFA. It's amazing how much expertise there is among idiot people. Um, but it's very striking to me because you can actually tell an awful lot by what somebody focuses on obsessively. And if you've decided that Gaza and Israel's reaction to the 7th and the attempt to get back the hostages and the attempt to punish by killing or capturing the leaders of Hamas is somehow the thing that is going to most energize you. Again, I could have some sympathy if those people had ever expressed any concern about the much greater, infinitely greater, humanitarian catastrophes which are going on as I speak. I see no people screaming outside the Kinshet Gabao because of the ongoing genocide in Sudan. By the way, there are almost no cameras in Sudan. I know one journalist is trying to get there. There are, I would have more sympathy with these protesters and others if they had spent the last decade or more marching and hollering and shouting and screaming and claiming that they're going to do a hunger strike, hunger strikes which tend to last about 12 hours. Um, and uh, if they had done any of that for 600,000 people or more killed in the last decade in the Syrian civil war, but not a peep, not a peep. Douglas Murray is absolutely correct in his scathing critique of the misplaced priorities in global attention. The focus on trivial matters while ignoring severe humanitarian crises like the ongoing genocide in Sudan is disgraceful. Those fixated on Gaza must explain their selective outrage. Why the deafening silence for the hundreds of thousands killed in the Syrian civil war? The thousand people killed in Yemen in recent years, not a demonstration, not a riot, not a placard. Some of the protesters have learned recently about the Houthis. Um, I'm not sure if they know the difference. They seem to think they're the same thing as the Hutus, but let's put that aside for a moment. Um, the Houthis had no, long, no, no sooner cropped up on the international stage uh, firing at ships in the uh, Red Sea and hitting a, a British vessel. No sooner had the protesters discovered the Houthis and they were hot for them as well. We had people in London chanting the next weekend, Yemen, Yemen, make us proud, turn another ship around. Imagine just finding out about a terrorist movement and knowing, yep, those are my guys. <laughs> They're the guys for me. And by the way, none of those people seem to object to the fact that 13 young men who were accused of being gay in Yemen last month were sentenced to death, including by crucifixion. Extraordinary thought that, again, an extraordinary place you can come to where you, you decide, I'm for anyone so long as they're against us. I'm for anyone as long as they're against the values that my society holds dear. I'm for anyone so long as they're against, and I would say that you can insert at that point the word, the Jews. Extraordinary thing in Israel in recent months has been that sometimes not only a flare goes up, but sometimes a, a crack happens in the universe. You suddenly get a very, very clear glimpse into true human evil. And we in the West have been very, very lucky in our lifetimes to very rarely glimpse that. And when we have glimpsed it, occasionally, in this country, in Paris, in Manchester and elsewhere, we tend to brush it aside or push it past us and hope we don't see it again. But in Israel on the 7th, something shattered over the whole of the society. It didn't matter whether the people in the south of Israel were Orthodox Jews or Ashkenazi or Sephardi or secular or reform, it didn't matter what color their skin was, that they were the targets because they were Jews. And I can tell you that the 
clarification that this has caused in Israeli society is very, very little understood outside Israel. Douglas Murray is absolutely right. The deafening silence regarding the atrocities in Yemen, where 300,000 people perished, is appalling. While some protest trivial matters, they ignore grave injustices. It's bewildering how swiftly support can shift towards terrorist groups like the Houthis. The stark reality in Israel uncovers true human evil. The world must awaken to these brutal truths. I was in a, one of the kibbutz, uh, Beiri, where uh, a man who I spoke to in the hospital had, uh, had uh, been in his safe room which some of you will know, all of the communities there had safe rooms in their houses, but they didn't lock. They were safe rooms to expect rocket fire, which happened all the time. They became far too used to. But they didn't lock because nobody expected gunmen to come house to house. All of the houses in Beirut and near Oz and so on, the ones that are not burnt down, uh, you go to the safe rooms and there are bullet marks around the handle. Because in every one, the person on the other side was trying to hold the handle down. And uh, some people held out for a while, some didn't. I spoke to one man who lost both his grandsons. Uh, they called him and said, we're in the safe room on our own, what do we do? And he told them to tie a, hand, a rope around the handle and try to hold it down. But uh, they were 13 and 14 and they didn't last very long against the, the grown-ups of Hamas. Another man I spoke to was in his safe room with his family and he did manage to keep the door shut and um, then he discovered that the terrorists had set light to the house. So they were in the unenviable position a lot of families were in on the day of either burning to death in their homes or having to flee and being machine gunned and they watched neighbours having that done to them. He realised that the house was burning down. They'd he ended up opening the air vent in the uh, safe room. And uh, he was there with his son and his daughter and his wife. And the terrorists threw a grenade in and killed his wife. And uh, then a gun came through and shot his son in both sides of his chest. And he bled out in front of his sister and father. And his father, who lost his legs in this, I spoke to in the hospital. And he said, you know, Douglas, I was a leftist all my life. Now, this isn't to make a political point, but it's to say many of these people in the communities that were most affected were people who did everything they could in their lives to live in peace with their Palestinian neighbors. They had people who drove Palestinian children to Israeli hospitals to get treatment. There was one woman of 74 who did that every single week, and she was killed and burnt in her home by Hamas. There were people who employed Palestinian workers from Gaza because they desperately dreamed of the day when they could live in peace with their Palestinian neighbors, only to find that when the terrorists came to their communities, these people they thought were their friends in many cases, had given to Hamas the complete maps of where to go and when in the communities. About 20 kilometers from the Gaza border, there's a town called Ofakim, it became quite famous because of a woman called Raquel, who is a rather remarkable woman in her 70s. And the Hamas came to her house and sought sanctuary, and she, she fed them and talked to them in Arabic and sort of treated the, her, them like a Jewish mother and sort of... It's very strange. And sometime at the very end of the day, she managed to get out of her house, and the, uh, there was a massive firefight, and she walked out into the street and met a policeman who said... We know there are 14 terrorists who've come into our community, but we've only found 13. She said, oh, yes, there's one in my cupboard. Um, but in Offa Kim, one of the survivors showed me, who was a member of the Knesset, a member of parliament, showed me the map of one of the terrorists got from the body, and it showed his house on the map. The people his community had been employing in order to live in peace had given the intelligence to Hamas and on the map, because they knew it was a holy day, they had the first target was his house, and then the next targets were the kindergartens and the synagogues. It really does take something to regard the people who dreamed these dreams of peace as the 
victimizers and Hamas as somehow the victims. But yet that seems to be where much of the world has landed. It's decided, among other things, because the only acceptable form of anti-Semitism today is anti-Zionism. Some people occasionally forget to say anti-Zionism and say Jews, but many people have kept disciplined on this one. Many people seem to claim that Israel, in response to a massacre like the 7th, should either do nothing or should act on the advice of a few online Twitter warriors. It's a very curious thing, this. If you, I've been to Gaza quite a lot in recent months, and uh, if you see the IDF in action, it's a form of discipline in army I've never seen in any other war. They know, every single young man and woman in Gaza knows their terms of operation, and much of this is house-to-house -house fighting of an unbelievably difficult kind. One in every two houses in Gaza as a whole has arms dumps of some kind. Uh, some months ago I spoke to a commander in the Gaza whose job it was to try to locate tunnel entrances as well as arms dumps, and he said, we now no longer, if we enter a house, we now no longer look for the tunnels or the munitions in any other room other than the children's room. So we go straight to the children's room. And you turn over the cot and you'll find a rocket-propelled grenade or a tunnel entrance. And many of these tunnel entrances are booby-trapped. And Israel has lost a lot of young soldiers in precisely those circumstances. It's lost soldiers because very often, as any soldier will tell you, a group of civilians come out with their hands raised and then from the middle of the civilians come a few Hamas gunmen. Douglas Murray is absolutely right. Consider the bravery of a woman from Ovakim who faced Hamas terrorists but still helped. Hamas uses civilians as human shields, showing their barbarity. Israel's actions are a result of defense against these threats. Yet the world condemns Israel. Isn't it unjust to vilify Israel for protecting itself from terrorists? A few days ago, the whole world was obsessed with what they reported on the news as being a an Israeli bombing of a refugee camp. Most of the news that reported that did not report that instead of the Israelis being wildly keen on just bombing refugee camps, and like, why would they want to do that? The attack in question came because Hamas, in their infinite care for civilian Palestinian human life, launched a set of rockets at Tel Aviv from between the tents that Palestinians were in. And the Israelis struck the launch site, and it turned out that Hamas was using it also as a munitions dump, so there was a secondary explosion. But if you look at much of the world's press, and from what I can see, even the Dutch press, they only report that first thing. They only say, Israelis have struck a refugee camp. It was the same at the beginning of the war. I was uh, by the Shifa hospital when uh, that was the focus of the world's attention. It took Israel months to identify just how many people were murdered on the 7th. But amazingly, Hamas can come up with round figures very swiftly. And there was an explosion near the Shifa hospital, which is actually not a hospital, it's more of an arms control dump and also an interrogation system. And um, there was a bomb there and all the world's press said Within minutes, Israel bombs the Shifa hospital. And again, I said, well, what monsters would do this? What monsters would, would attack a hospital? First of all, of course, as I say, it's not a hospital. It's a command headquarters. But it took, it took days and weeks, even the press who had reported that first incident, to say, actually... Uh, it was a rocket fired by Islamic Jihad in the Gaza, which, like quite a lot of their rockets, fell short and landed in the car park. But Hamas immediately said at the time, 500 people have been killed, and the world reported this number. Not only was the story false, the numbers false, the whole thing was a crock. 
But as Mark Twain famously said, sometimes a lie can get all the way around the world before the truth can even get its boots on. One of the reasons I think, by the way, we should mind about this is because if Israel is not allowed to fight a war of self-defense in order to recapture its stolen civilians, then down the road, neither will a country like this one or a country like mine. Douglas Murray rightly exposed the media's bias in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The recent bombing was a necessary response to Hamas using civilians as shields. The truth was obscured as the world condemned Israel without context. Misinformation like this endangers true justice and self-defense rights globally. Should countries not defend their people from such manipulation and danger? Think about it. Deemed unacceptable to want to reclaim your citizens and want to punish people who wish to destroy you, then we are all going to be in a great deal of trouble next. Um, if you do the math, the equivalent of the seventh would be somewhere in the region of 3,000 Dutch civilians being killed in one day and some 700 stolen into captivity. I think very highly of this country, but I would like to think that if that happened here, your country and your government would not sit back with equanimity and simply allow that not to be responded to. And if there were an organization or an entity anywhere in the world so mad as to want the destruction and murder of the entire population of this country, I would expect you to have not just the world's sympathy, but the world's support if you decided that that was something you could not live with. And that's why I think that the ability of Israel to fight wars is also the ability of our own to fight wars. But that's not the only reason, of course, to be concerned about this subject which we are gathered here today to discuss, and I'm looking forward to questions in a second. Perhaps above all else, the reason why anti-Semitism is an issue that needs to be discussed and thought about is because, of course, as all historians know, it is the most reliable precursor, the most reliable guide if anti-Semitism flares up in a society and is tolerated and Jews can't go safely down the streets of cities like this one, it is the sign that the society is in decay and that everybody else will be next. The curse of the Jewish people is to be the canary in this coal mine, but the world's desire to shoot the canary seems to me to be perverse at any rate. There's a lot to unpack, and I'm looking forward to your questions and the rest of this evening. So thank you. Douglas Murray convincingly argues for Israel's right to defend its citizens and punish those aiming to harm them. Imagine 3,000 Dutch civilians killed in a day. Wouldn't the country act? Anti-Semitism signals societal decay. Safeguarding Jews protects all. Shouldn't we support self-defense against those seeking mass destruction? Let's discuss and confront these crucial issues. It's time to act, not just react. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. We will now open up the room for some questions. Our uh, lovely Inge Marie will go around the crowd. Um, I, yeah. um, I think we'll do five questions. And please, like in Dutch Parliament, a question is one, maybe two sentences long, and always ends with a question mark. So don't let the speaker. You don't want to know the Dutch thing. They can talk like I can, but I'm, but I'm here. Um, vragen, heel veel. Zullen we bij jou beginnen? Ja. Ja. Ah, hello. Um, as a student, I've been like fighting anti-Semitism and anti-Israel feelings on campuses a lot in the past three years. 
um, and I feel like the ball isn't rolling yet. What do you think will get the ball rolling? I think that once, once it does roll, it'll keep rolling, but um, we're not there. So do you think there is a way to push the ball? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, is it p possible to defeat Hamas? Douglas, do you want to may maybe do three questions or five? Three? Okay. Um, Alexander, there? Yeah. There's, yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Mr. Murray. Uh, but first, I want to say something. Um, Okay, <laughs> this is better. Um, I think um, it's uh, it's very special to have someone here like you, who, as a journalist, doesn't just write his articles um, on the basis of the information that he gets from his desk, but actually searches the truth directly in the country, in the war zones, going there. And be an eyewitness, and on the basis of that, write your articles. So for that, I think you have to be very courageous, and I think you're a great man. Thank you. Now, now my question. Uh, my question is the following. Uh, I've heard you talk a lot about the phenomenon uh, of uh, anti-Semitism in the world. I didn't hear anything about what causes anti-Semitism, and I think you need to know the cause in order to be able to fight it. Could you say something on that? Those are very good questions. Let me take them in no particular order. Um, first of all, is it possible to defeat Hamas? Yes. The audience put forth their questions about tackling anti-Semitism, its causes, and would it be possible to defeat Hamas once and for all? Now let's see Douglas masterfully respond to these queries from the audience. It's eminently possible, and the IDF is a long way into doing that. Um, it is only one arm of the Iranian revolutionary government in Tehran, who also have Hezbollah on the northern border, which is another subject which the world ignores. You've got 100,000 Israeli families who can't go to their homes because of the Hezbollah rocket fire, but the world seems to be totally uninterested in these Jewish refugees. Um, it is possible to defeat Hamas, it's extremely difficult, but the last stage is underway, the last stage is what's happening in Rafa. Some people say it's not possible because Hamas is an idea. There is something in that, but as a structure, as an organization, as a group that is financed, which is armed, trained, it's eminently possible. Um, there are leaders of Hamas around the world, including in London. I wouldn't mind there being some foggy incidents around them. But, um, but the leadership inside Gaza is, is eminently possible to destroy. And when people say it's not possible, I always think, without going to the obvious comparison on our continent, think of the situation in 1945 with the Japanese. The Japanese had a truly zealous ideology and a form of idolatry in their emperor king. Most military and political analysts in 1945 believed that the Japanese would not give up, ever, because of the issue of pride, of the sheer, it's impossible to consider. When the emperor signs the document of defeat, that ideology disappeared. And today, Japan is a thriving, successful, magnificent, rich country. So it's eminently possible. But I believe, by the way, that peace will only come through defeating Hamas. The worst conditions are Israel being allowed to destroy Hamas a bit. That is, as I've said quite a lot in recent months, it's like saying... I will put out 80% of the fire in my house. You've got to put out the whole fire or there's no point. And uh, so, yes, it's possible. 
and uh, achievable. Um, getting the ball rolling on anti-Semitism, I think, was the, the question asked. You mean, the, you mean getting the ball rolling of opposition to the zealots, as it were? Yes. Well, first of all, I salute you um, and keep up the good work. Um, it might sometimes feel lonely out there, but um, my own experience of uh, any time you're doing something right but lonely is that you discover two great things on your side. The first is you make the best enemies. And the second thing is you make the best friends, so don't give up. Um, in terms of getting the ball rolling, I would definitely divide your time ad adequately, you know. Don't deal with the people who are, you know, full-on Hamas. Absolutely correct. Douglas Murray shatters illusions about Hamas. Defeating them is tough, but very possible, just as Japan's transformation showed. Hamas must be dismantled for lasting peace. Disregarding Israeli families terrorized by Hezbollah is appalling. It's time to finish the job. Do you agree that total victory is the only true path to peace and justice? Let's act decisively. You know, full on Hamas. You know, they're kind of unlikely to be persuaded at this, at this time. Um, but there are obviously a very, very large number of your contemporaries who are just very, very misguided. Now they've been taught into that position, but that means they can be taught out of it. I have a sometimes forgiving spirit, which, uh, which suggests that certainly if you're about the age of 20, you should be allowed to be stupid for a while, you know. If you're 30 and you're still stupid, we've got a problem, Houston. But, but you know, speak, speak to the people who you think can be and also, of course, a great, a great thing is they operate by shame. And um, shame can be applied back to them. Um, as for the, uh, the gentleman there, your, thank you for your kind words. I, I do take the rather unfashionable position of a journalist and actually going to the places I'm writing about. Um, uh, but... You asked the source. I mean, when I described anti-Semitism as a shapeshifter, I tried to explain the fact that in a way the source is so amorphous it's very hard to, to, to pin down. If I had, if I had one, one thing that I would tie it down to very, very often, it's envy. Um, Shirk wrote a great book about this in the 20th century, but envy is an extraordinarily deep human emotion and, again, ineradicable. Think of all of the anti-Semites across Europe in the past. So often it was envy. Envy that the Jews had the money, for instance. Envy of the idea that Jews had some access in society. Look at the... Imagine what it's like for anyone in a country neighboring Israel. There are dozens and dozens of countries in the region which have Muslim Islamic governments of some kind. Most of them are run by sort of crime syndicate families and they take all the money and the people don't get any money. You know. Like if you go to a country in North Africa, as many of you will have done, you, you see these societies that have so much potential and the potential is squashed out of people. You see young men hanging around the souk with nothing to do. No job prospects. And then this country emerges. It's re-established in 1948. And within one generation is this miracle. And a country with no oil. I mean, and Moses also found a country with no water, which somebody should have pointed out. <laughs> it's very annoying. It makes life a lot easier if you have water. Um, this country with no oil and no water goes on to be this magnificent success story in the Middle East. And, and then it has high tech. And it has a standard of living many times higher than that of its neighbors. And if you're a young man living in Jordan or Egypt... Like Douglas Murray's insight in the interview resonates with a brutal truth. Envy of often drives hatred like anti-Semitism. Envy of Jewish success has fueled historical prejudices. Look at the contrast 
Neighboring countries squander potential while Israel thrives. Envy blinds many to see Israel's achievements, dismissing the hard work and resilience behind it. Shouldn't envy be replaced with admiration and motivation? Lebanon, very easy, let alone West Bank or Gaza. Why are they doing so well? And there's an additional one in Muslim anti-Semitism, which Bernard Lewis, among others, pointed out, which is, imagine what it's like if you've been told you've got the final revelation from God and the Jews are doing better than you. That's uncomfortable. So there's a lot of things it boils down to, but I would say envy is one of the deep, deep things in it. And, and as I said earlier from Vasily Grossman, look at all the people who are... What are they doing, these, these, I call them the ronin. In medieval Japan, there was a class of person known as the ronin who, they were people who had sworn fealty to a liege lord, a samurai warrior king, and their leader had died. The ronin were men, qualified warriors, who would walk around the land searching for a new lord to swear their oath to. That came to mind the other day when I looked at Greta Thunberg. <laughs> she, um, a few years ago, she came to some prominence because she, something that made me understand medieval Europe a bit better is when somebody from a country in the north with blazing eyes, a child, tells you you're all going to burn. <laughs> I think, wow. That makes me understand the Middle Ages a little bit better. Um, but first of, all, she was, she, first of all, she was for the green thing. And now she's still with the color green, so you've got to give her some consistency. But, uh, uh, but now it's Hamas. Where did, where did it end up that Greta Thunberg, trying to save us from fossil fuels, would end up in a square in Sweden screaming at a beautiful young Jewish singer? Only a lost soul, desperately staggering around the land, looking for purpose. Maybe her purpose should be found elsewhere or be better directed. Thank you, Douglas. We'll do one more set with three questions. Yeah, right there. And then you, sir. <laughs> okay, and Marcus, there. And please keep them short, guys, keep them short. Thank you very much, my name is Marcus. Um, I have a question. Um, you see uh, certain countries in uh, Europe uh, which are um, very much against, fanatical against uh, Israel lately, uh, and they uh, it comes partly from the old Catholic anti-Semitism. I'm talking about Spain, Ireland, and to a lesser ex extent, uh, Norway. And my question is, uh, you have now a division in Europe between these countries fiercely supporting, yeah, f basically Hamas, and other countries which are opposing this. So we have a, 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 a two camps in Europe. My question is, how do you think is, that is going to evolve in the coming time? Douglas Murray's insights are undeniably incisive. He accurately highlights the uncomfortable truth of envy fueling anti-Semitism, echoed by Bernard Lewis. When those believing in a final divine revelation witness Jews excelling, discomfort ensues. Murray's sharp analysis mirrors real world cases, like the stark prosperity comparison between young men in Muslim majority nations and Israel. Can we afford to ignore this searing reality? Hey, uh, thank you so much for being here. I really admire you and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is this, I want to address the big elephant in the room, the Islamic regime in Iran. I am originally self from Iran. Um, my question is this, uh, the Islamic regime right now is the biggest sponsor of anti-Semitism and chaos across the world. While its people, contrary to most people in the region, consider themselves the friends of the Jews, the friends of the Israelis. And we have even seen protests against this regime. But the, the stance from the West 
in regards to the regime has been weak, to say the least. And the one thing that people asked during the protests were like, if you don't help us, that's fine. We'll take them down ourselves, but don't help them. But we see the opposite. We see like them standing up for the butcher of Tehran. We see them helping, finding him. So my question is, what is to be done on the side of the West and what is to be done on our side, on the Iranian side, to get rid of this, the largest source, in my opinion, of anti-Semitism? Thank you. Okay, one more for this set. Thank you very much. Uh, would you agree, Mr. Murray, that the uh, current wave of anti-Semitism is based on the fallacy that the State of Israel was founded on a nation called Palestine, which never existed as such? And would you then, if you agree, um, uh, um, uh, uh, join me in no longer using the uh, fallacious words Palestinians, Palestine, pro-Palestinian protest, which all seem to perpetuate the myth mm. that Jews are villains who steal other people's countries. Yes, that's a very brilliant point. And then the audience continues to put forth questions for Douglas to answer. Now let's hear it from Douglas. And you're right, and it's very important. The world didn't ever talk about Palestinians as such until around 1964, as you know. It sort of, it, and then it really came in after 67 and 73. Um, they were called the Arabs. And uh, I mean, the Palestinian peoples are a set of tribes and families. And um, I have a friend who was born in Gaza in the time when Egypt ran it. And she was an Egyptian. She wasn't a Palestinian. She isn't a Palestinian. Um, and yes, the, the, the development of the idea of the Palestinian people, which is a misnomer in my view, was because it made the Jews the usurpers and it made the Jews the overlords. And it's very, very interesting because this it was a brilliant, brilliant tactic to do that. Um, now you also get the one where um, people claim that the Jews sort of just arrived from Europe and had no historic connection with this land. And you know, you get the, the, the churches are responsible for much of this in the West. They, they do all these things like Jesus was a Palestinian. You know. It's not a very accurate reading of the text. Um, uh, but, but yes, it, 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 it is enormously dangerous because it also plays into the thing which is the ideology of our time that spilt out from the idiots in American campuses all over the place. As my friend Andrew Sullivan said, we all live on campus now, regrettably. Um, and that is the idea that the whole world, and it just came from America, this idea, the whole world can be divided into victim and victimizer, oppressor and oppressed, colonizer and colonized, and so on and so on and so on. And of course, it's a totally inadequate way to understand America. But to try to impose that on the Middle East and on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, the Israeli-Arab question, is, is, is quite wrong. Um, the Iranian regime, I'm so glad you asked that. This is a very big, big one, isn't it? I mean, um, I agree with you. Everything one hears from, from the people of Iran is to wish to live in peace. And of course the regime wants exactly the opposite. Uh, the problem of the regime in Tehran is such a serious one. I mean, by the end of Trump's presidency, whatever one thinks of him, and you may have noticed there are some criticisms that can be leveled, um, whatever you think of him, he did actually bring the mullahs to their knees financially. And that, that had some good consequences. Um, and I think would encourage the people to take back their country from this vile regime. Again, I mean, it's astonishing. Um, just yesterday or the day before, uh, uh, the Supreme Leader sent out this message of thanks to American students for turning out on campus on the side of the Palestinians. I mean, 
if I was one of those protesters, I'm not sure if I'd retweet that. <laughs> it, it should be regarded as embarrassing. Um, but there's such confusion. Douglas Murray relentlessly nails it on the head, exposing the historical manipulation behind the concept of Palestinian identity. The notion of victim oppressor narratives plaguing Western thought dangerously distorts realities in the Middle East. The Iranian regime's deceit versus the desires of the Iranian people starkly illustrate the urgent need for change. Murray's unflinching clarity is a beacon in a murky world. And on this, in the West, um, when Raisi had his helicopter crash the other week, uh, I said uh, to some friends, I said, let's just wait and see how he's described by the mainstream media. And um, in the end, we came, we got mixed legacy Raisi. That was kind of cute for a guy who hangs people from cranes. Mixed legacy. It's true, he hanged some people, shot others. <laughs> um, so, swings and roundabouts. Um, I, 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 I'm amazed by those ones. I, I keep a record of the, the way in which you can, you can flex somebody's reputation by just that one term. My friend Jordan Peterson is always described as controversial professor Jordan Peterson. I knew that it wouldn't be controversial leader Raisi. No, 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 mixed legacy. Jordan would never get mixed legacy, just controversial. But Raisi, mixed legacy. Just like, what was it, al-Baghdadi was described in the Washington Post after his uh, early demise as a, an austere religious scholar. <laughs> well, it's a bit of the truth, but uh, not the whole of it. I, mean, I just would hope with everyone that my Iranian friends and Persian friends someday can live in peace in their country, and they deserve it. It's one of the great civilizations of the world. As for Spain and Ireland and so on, um, I, I refer you back to what I said earlier about the, the people staggering around the land looking for purpose. Um, Ireland is a particularly fascinating one. I was saying this to somebody at dinner. Ireland, in my own lifetime, went from being a highly religious society to the most secular society in Europe, had the terrible, terrible Catholic Church abuse scandal. And in the 2000s, people just fell away from the church in Ireland at such a speed. And they sort of picked up this sort of weird woke thing from America, and that became the new faith. And, um, and, and they've be, they, they, they struggle for this meaning, for attachment to a cause. And, and some of that goes back some way. Many of the terrorists of the IRA trained with, uh, with, with various Palestinian factions and so on. And, um, Spain is a very interesting one. I'm not sure if that is a, relig a religious explanation anymore. I mean, Spain is obviously still a very religious country in parts, but I, I think the left-wing deputy prime minister, who last week said, from the river to the sea, I don't know if that's religious. I think that's the new cult of woke, I think, that's taken over her. I think it's that sort of weird religion of oppressor oppressed that I was describing earlier. Um, but what a thing to say. What a thing to say. I mean, I would have thought that if an Israeli uh, politician said, you know, we need to make sure that the Arabs reconquer Al-Andalusi, that the Spanish government would feel kind of sore about that. <laughs> um, so I think it's an appalling intervention. Uh, Douglas Murray is absolutely right in highlighting the skewed media portrayal of individuals like Ruhollah Khomeini and Jordan Peterson. The mainstream media's biased labeling of individuals as controversial or mixed legacy is a ploy to manipulate public perception. Isn't it alarming how easily reputations can be distorted by a mere choice of words? When will the media show the same honesty and integrity in reporting on all matters by the Spanish? I, I, it, it'll be very interesting to see how this pans out in Europe. There's one other thing, of course, which is pandering. Pandering will be the, the, one of the things to look out for. Um, certain leaders have decided to pander to small or large percentages of their population who they believe, rightly, are very het up over this issue. And I would just say to the people who want to go that route. You know the, 
The people in our own countries who support Hamas do not only support Hamas. And the ones in our own countries who deeply desire the destruction of the Jewish state do not only desire the destruction of the Jewish state. There is one thing you can tell with 100% certainty about every anti-Israel protest in any Western country. They never have the flag of the country they're in anywhere in evidence. They never sing the national anthem of the country they're in. They always, in fact, hate the country they're in. The protesters in America who hate Israel hate the American flag. I was speaking at a commencement address the other day, an alternative commencement address for some of the poor students of a university in America that weren't allowed their commencement because of protests. And uh, he had fought for the American army. He'd fought in the American army in Afghanistan and Iraq. And in November, he went onto campus with the American flag and he was chased off campus. And he said to me, you know, Douglas, I, I risked my life for that flag and I lost friends for that flag. And to meet people at home who believed that, place, that flag had no place here hurt more than anything. I, I would urge you as a point of uh, scientific experiment, next time you see a pro-Hamas protest here, urge them to sing your national anthem. See what they say. Okay, thank you. We'll have the last three questions. Dr. Douglas Murray is absolutely right in condemning leaders who pander to extremist sentiments against Israel. The anti-Israel protests in Western countries reveal a disturbing trend of hatred towards the nations hosting them. Those who support Hamas and seek Israel's downfall show a blatant disrespect for their own countries. Should such divisive agendas be allowed to flourish unchecked? What values are truly at stake here? The last three questions, please. Jordan. Raido. Die valt daar eentje. En dan kunnen we misschien nog eentje achterin pakken. Thank you, Douglas, for your courage and for your truth speaking. Um, I have one question about the silent majority of Europe and of the West and of the students at the universities. Most of them don't go protest with all these slogans and don't agree with it. But many people lack the courage you seem to have. So what can we do in order that the silent majority gets up, rises up. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me that after your visit in Israel, you are a little bit more positive about uh, defending uh, Western values. And how do you think about uh, Europe defending Western values? Because it seems to me we are highly divided countries. Thank you very much, Douglas, for sharing your insights and experiences from Israel. Uh, my question was, isn't there an, an even more underlying cause for anti-Semitism and all of this, such as um, China and Russia trying to destroy our Western values and the existence of um, Palestine and this movement being originating from leftist movement from the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, isn't that what we should focus on, uh, like the root, root cause? And uh, because it's not against only Jews, it's against Western values at all. Yes, I mean, there is quite a lot of evidence from online in particular. In the last round of questioning, the audience seeks Murray's insights on the troubling issue of the silent majority, the defense of Western values. And a deeper layer of anti-Semitism beyond envy possibly orchestrated by anti-democratic forces like Russia and China. Murray is called upon to illuminate these critical topics, shedding light on the complex web of global dynamics at play. ...of the way in which various of our competitors and opponents like to help us in our own derangement. Um, it's, it's, it's very convenient for the Chinese Communist Party that, you know, everyone in the West is trying to work out what a woman is. Um, 
at the same time as they're taking over Africa. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's very useful for them. Um, and if I were them, I'd push that as well. But what do you do about gender-neutral toilets? Ah! <laughs> Meanwhile, they take over Congo. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a neat move, that. And there's certainly evidence that, that, that some of these protest movements get encouragement, certainly, and, and some false information definitely gets spun around. TikTok's a very interesting one in this war, that there was, a, there was clearly a, a switch flipped early on in the war that meant that like 95% of the accounts suddenly were anti-Israel. And uh, that's the Chinese Communist Party playing their, their tricks. They know, it's, you know, they know that it's deranging to Westerners, and um, that's good for them. They love that. Um, but, but yes, it's, it's a very important point. Um, the silent majority is a very, very difficult one, that. I've, I've been told all my life about the silent majority, and I believe in them, but I wish they wouldn't be so damn silent. <laughs> um, but I do believe in a decency and a common sense that is reclaimable. But it requires people to stand up, and you have had people who've done that in this country, you know, to gr at great expense and risk their own lives. You've had that. This country actually has, has produced for some years some pretty remarkable people from a wide array of backgrounds. And I think that this country should, should honor the courageous. I have one thing in particular which I would say that, I mean, by the way, when you mentioned that most students don't agree with this, it's absolutely true. There was a poll out the other day that showed the amount you pay for your education versus the amount of protests on your campus. And the most elite, expensive institution that had the best, the, mo sorry, the largest number of protests, and the ones that were sort of technical colleges where people are actually learning something. No protests. Well, you know, I'm, um, I'm delighted to encourage that trend and uh, to say, you know, if it might actually in future be for parents quite a useful guide. It would be for me if I was a parent sending a child to college. I think one of the things I would look at is uh, are students encouraged to waste their time shouting on campus to somebody who can't hear? And that would be one. Stop the war. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu isn't listening to students in Rotterdam. Who do you think you are? A narcissist? A bore? An ignoramus? What are you? And why have you been created? Um, I am... Um, not to be too harsh, but the, the... Let me just finish on this one of positivity. <laughs> let me finish on this one of... Douglas Murray rightly exposes how adversaries manipulate Western distractions for their gain. China's sly moves in Africa coincide with our baffling obsession over gender labels. While we ponder gender-neutral toilets, they conquer nations. Isn't it high time we awaken from this self-inflicted stupor and confront these strategic diversions head-on? The silent majority must find its voice against such cunning subversion. Positivity, you're quite right, sir. Um, I do actually... I, I wrote a book some years ago, The Strange Death of Europe, which was about our continent. And um, in the years since, at various times, people, readers have said to me, you know, that was a very depressing book to read. I said, yeah, you should have tried writing it. Uh, um, uh, but there is, a lot, there, is a, there is a lot that is very troubling about Europe today, in my own country included. A lot of deep, deep problems ahead, you know. Uh, when I see 100,000, 200,000 angry people, mainly Muslim, chant, you know, chanting through the streets of London, I don't think this is a problem for the Israelis. I think it's a problem for us. And um, I wish more people saw that. But just to end on this thought, you're right, actually. I have had a sort of certain injection of positivity, and I'll tell you why. It's because of the young Israelis. Um, older Israelis quite often used to say that the young generation had become weak, you know, that they'd sort of wanted to spend all their time on TikTok and Instagram. They all wanted to party in Tel Aviv. Uh, they'd become, eh, you know, weak. And it just isn't the case. They've been magnificent. And I see them in the field. These beautiful young women, 19, I saw recently, or some months ago, at the 
place where all of the cars from the Nova Festival, which had been burned out and shot at, or they'd all been brought to this one place so that the last of the body parts could be taken out. And these, uh, this was being done by all these you know, very special people who deal with the dead. And these young women of 19 were all there helping out. I could have cried when I said to them, you know, how old are you, 19? Wow. Your contemporaries in America and Britain and Holland, they haven't seen a fraction of what you've seen. But that's your advantage. You know, there was a young woman at a dinner in uh, Tel Aviv some time ago who was sitting opposite me at dinner on a Friday night, and I said, what do you do? Well, she, I said, how old are you? She said, I'm 23. I said, what do you do? She said, I'm an intelligence expert on Yemen. <sighs> <laughs> She's going to be someone. <laughs> you know? She's going to know more at 24 than someone in Britain will by the time they die. But it's a demonstration of the fact that sometimes when things become serious, if you've prepared yourselves, and you've prepared your kids and your generation, then they might step up too. And you know, the, there's always that question, I always had it all my life, I'm sure all you did as well. You always had this question after the war, which was sort of, who would I have been? What would I have done? Could I have risen to, to be heroic in the way that so many people were? And it's always a question. Well, the young generation in Israel had that question, but they've answered it. And I would just say that, you know, it's a sign to us, in my view, that if the time of trial ever came to us, we should be so lucky as to have a young generation like they do there. And we should hope they would do the same thing. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Douglas Murray is right in his stark depiction of Europe's struggles. While some label his observations bleak, facing reality is grimmer. When thousands chant angrily in London, it's not just Israel's issue, it's ours. Yet amidst the turmoil, Murray finds hope in a resilient young Israeli generation, defying stereotypes and stepping up when needed. Can such resilience inspire change elsewhere? If you too, like Douglas, found these young Israelis inspiring, subscribe to our channel and leave a like. And let us know in the comments, what do you think is the underlying cause of anti-Semitism?